extremely briefly, but uh, welcome all, one and all, to a joint collaboration between the Drama School Mumbai and uh, Embodied Poetics, um, and um, also a joint collaboration between Amy and me, um, because uh, it just started with me trying to figure out a few questions about how do we move forward in this time. And, um, I, and at the same time, Amy came to, 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 to teach one of our first global faculty program uh, offerings, which was basically a Zoom class where somebody international zoomed into India, the virtual India, and created and, and you know, to our virtual shows and, and gave us a class. And Amy used it as a space to try out something new called Rewilding Your Living Room that became Rewilding Your Living Room 2 that became rewilding a living room three uh, because it was just a really uh, great exploration that she had and uh, we got talking and um, whilst the first eight which was sort of curated in a slightly ad hoc way but sort of created a certain logic started to emerge it really was how we were responding to this time this this pandemic time but now we realize that it that that disruption is constant that change is so constant now and so frequent and pace of change that that we really do not know what the future holds and it constantly surprises us in, in much more dramatic ways than before and the pandemic is just one such example as somebody else said um pandemic wait for climate change you ain't seen nothing yet so i mean that's the that's the context in which all of this is happening and so as so we feel like we can just have this ongoing series of conversations where the drama school mumbai holds space uh, Amy curates beautifully, and uh, we just go deeper and deeper into new, into into questions, into specific aspects, and the trajectory that Amy has created has just been uh, lovely. And I uh, just look forward to showing up every uh, Thursday. Um, and the conversation can stay alive later on uh, if you want to. There's a Telegram group on the app called Telegram because it's privater than WhatsApp. Um, and it's a chat place that you can come to. Uh, and uh, Falguni Rao uh, is a writer and a journalist also, and one of my alumni, and she writes reported pieces based on the recordings. Uh, and those go up on our website. So you can see all of the previous talks in five or seven pages. Uh, just go to the Drama School Mumbai blog. And um, if you guys think we should be going in a particular direction with the conversations, if you guys uh, want to share what this has been doing for you, for those of you who've been coming to it regularly, Pauline, um, please do write us an email. Please do to share share with us. It, it's really important that we hear from you. I know from Kali's point of view and my point of view, uh, when we had conversations of how we were going to create the digital course, uh, these conversations really, really helped us and they continue to help us. So that's why we keep coming back for more. And that's me. Amy, you, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, thanks for mentioning the kind of <clears throat> arc that uh, that you know you and I discussed uh, creating with these nine talks. So uh, uh, responsibility, responding to changing times with theater pedagogy. Uh, so assuming that we all have something to do with that, um, we're really looking at what can theater practitioners do in these dramatic and changing times and. Uh, Mark uh, Evans and Aurelian Koch are here with me today, tonight, to discuss um, what interdisciplinarity can offer to theater artists, so possible resiliency in interdisciplinary approaches to the arts involving theater. And um, Mark and Aurelian and I are preoccupied at the moment with Jacques Lecoq's LEM, which was a, an interdisciplinary endeavor uh, that developed into an experimental wing at the Lecoq School. We'll talk more about that. But first, I'd like to introduce my two guests. So um, uh, Aurelien Koch studied at the Ecole Jacques Lecoq in Paris, where he also studied in the LEM, which stands for the Laboratory for the Study of Movement. And uh, he founded a theater company, Bouge de la, based on his work in the LEM and uh, ran that company for a number of years, creating many shows. And since then, he's been principally involved, I think really, in, I'm correct in saying, in creating pedagogic laboratories for the study of um, what the LEM does in regards to uh, other art forms. So theater and also architect, you work with architects and you work with mm -hmm. graphic designers and you work with a lot of different disciplines, trying sort of bringing the LEM to different disciplines. Um, yeah. And um, 
you've been a teacher at a number of drama schools, including LISPA and the Oxford School of Drama, and now at Embodied Poetics with me, which is a great privilege and lots of fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mark Evans is a professor of theater and training and education and associate dean of the School of Art and Design at Coventry University. He also studied in Paris with Jacques Lecoq and also with Philippe Gaulier and Monica Pagneux. And his previous publications include Jacopo's Rutledge 2006 uh, and Movement Training for the Modern Actor Rutledge 2009. He's associate editor of theater, dance and performance training recently edited a special issue on sports and performance training. Um, would you like to add anything to that, uh, Mark, about your interest in the LEM? Um, yeah, well, <clears throat> um, more recently, I've written more about Lecoq. So I was uh, the, one of the co-editors of the Routledge Companion to Jacques Lecoq and uh, recently wrote the introduction to the latest edition of The Moving Body, uh, the first, issue to first edition to have a, a critical introduction to it. Um, and so my, my interest in Lecoq really comes from having studied there uh, and, and then just uh, spending the last 20, 30 years thinking about what that, uh, what that actually meant and what, it, um, what the repercussions and significances of that, of that training are. Oh, I should just add, I'm no longer the Associate Dean in the faculty. I've, uh, I've, shackled off, I've shuffled off that, uh, that particular coil of um, worries and strife. And, uh, yeah. Good. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we thought we would begin. I mean, uh, many of you may not know much about the LEM. We thought that we would begin. Uh, Mark would uh, begin with a description of what it what it is, and uh, then Aurelian and I would also chime in. And then we we thought we would uh, proceed, um, also responding to your questions and comments in the chat, but to describe how it uh, how it works and how it might even be applied you might apply ideas from it uh, as theater pedagogues yourselves. So um, that's sort of the, the, the roughly the shape of the discussion. Um, so Mark, would you like to begin with some remarks about what the LEM is and, and also I think contextualizing Jacques Lecoq and his influence on theater pedagogy at, in schools and universities? Uh, yeah, I'll just talk a little bit, I'll do the, first, the last bit first if you like. So um, when I studied at the school, that was in the early 80s, and at that point, there was relatively limited impact, I think it'd be fair to say, on the wider education sector, outside of a selected number of, of schools and universities who had alumni who were teaching there. But over the last 30, 40 years, that's expanded quite significantly, and I think now a lot of drama, almost all the drama schools, the drama conservatoires in England, for instance, have somebody on staff who has um, an experience of or training in uh, Lecoq pedagogy um, and that's pretty much replicated in a large number of other countries around the world now. The, the reach is, is, um, is truly international um, <clears throat> and that has been an influence that has risen as well I think with an understanding that drama and theatre isn't just about text, it isn't just about Stanislavski, it is about the body, it is about understanding the ways in which we physically interact with the world around us. It's a way of understanding the miming body, that how, how our bodies um, are affected by and give back to the world around us. So I think that's been a major change over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, and the, an understanding of our embodiment has been key to many developments in theatre and in the teaching of theatre. Uh, uh, over the last 30, 40 years. Um, in terms of the LEM, um, my first experience of the LEM was as a, was, uh, I, I didn't actually study the LEM, so I was peeking through the door. <clears throat> I was the person looking down the ramshackle corridor full of uh, what appeared to be just a ramshackle corridor full of sort of bits of wood and paper and card and string and all of these wonderful things. Then occasionally we'd get to see uh, some of the students would sort of invite us to come and watch a few things that, that they'd been um, doing and, and making. Um, but it was clear, even way, way back then in the, in the 80s, it was clearly something that uh, Lecoq was very, very committed to. And there was a strong sense that this was a key part, a foundational part of his own personal research. <clears throat> and that it was, it was an extension, it was not just an extension of the school, but in some ways it was kind of fundamental to what the school was doing and what the school was about. And again, I think that comes back to, if you like, the notion of the miming body. It starts with the, the person understanding the world, reenacting the world, 
through their own physical experience, through through the doing of that, and then extends that far beyond the, the school focused very much on the actor or the performer all the way through. That was the sort of heart of it. Whereas I think the really interesting thing about the LEM is that it goes way beyond that. It looks far, far beyond just the actor and the performer in theatre and looks at space, at shape, at motion, at all of these um, concepts, not in a conceptual way, in a way in which you're engaged in doing and making and moving um, these things. Um, I'm sure if, I, if I've got any of that wrong, I'm sure <laughs> Amy and Reggie will probably write. Um, the significance of that, I think, is still yet to come. I think whereas we've seen Lecoq's work influence actor training quite significantly over the last 30, 40 years, what we haven't seen yet, except perhaps in much smaller instances, is the way in which um, a, 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 um, an approach to learning and making such as the LEM could be far more um, part of you know, future development for theatre pedagogy, not, not just for theatre pedagogy, but for pedagogy in a wider sense, um, as it looks at ways of bringing together different disciplines, nominally within the context of theatre training, but I think it, ex it has the potential to ex expand way beyond that. That's great. What a, that's a great introduction. Um, Aurelian, yeah. would you, uh, having done two years of the LEM, Aurelian, you did something very unusual. Lecoq extended the LEM into the second year when Aurelian and I were training together at the Lecoq School. Um, so you really, uh, you got a sort of double dose of it. Um, how yeah. would you, to a, to a, someone who didn't know what the LEM was, how, how would you make an introduction to it? Well, I think one of the interesting points about the LEM um, in respect of the interdisciplinary uh, side of things is how the LEM actually came about, how it was developed, this approach, this pedagogy. And what it was is um, it sort of resulted from a meeting of Jacques Lecoq, who's a theatre practitioner, we know, and Krigo Belekian, who is an architect. He's a, a Lebanese architect, or was. Um, yeah. uh, um, so the two of them met, and what they realised is that they had an same in the interest in the same thing but came from two polar opposite sides. So the architect came from a, a very constructed, very hard. Lecoq came from, from a, a movement side, from, from the physical body. But what they were interested is combining the two. And so the fact that it was born out of, of uh, this meeting of those two minds and they developed the approach together immediately makes it utterly interdisciplinary. And it can never, the dilemma, therefore, can never be either theatre or architecture or anything else. It always falls between things. And that's, I think, where its, its strength lies. Um, yeah. So you, you um, recently have been uh, doing some work with architects and you said that there was a moment mm. where the penny dropped for an architect about what he was actually in the process of exploring. Um, can you describe but, that? But yeah, well, the penny dropped for a whole room of architects. And it's quite, you know, uh, it, it, it's not an easy gig going to an architect's practice and, and rock up with bits of cardboard and hoop hot glue guns and wooden sticks and things. Because they all go, what the hell? You know, um, but I got them to move. And, and uh, I mean, this is sort of, talks about the process of the lens and that's quite interesting um, because you generally sort of start with movement um, and what I got them to do and I shall share a little picture um, of, of one of my courses not with the architects so what I started doing is uh, I started ask them to just um, let me see can you all see that wooden sticks so I asked them to just move wooden sticks in the space. I don't know, is the screen share okay? Can you all see mm -hmm. the picture? Yeah. Um, and they did all the classic things that people do um, when they, uh, when, when you say them, and that's performance and everything, it's a, hu it's a human nature thing that when you give them a, you give them a stick, us humans, we like to uh, know what things are. We like to give things meaning. So just giving them a stick and asking a, you know, a person to move a stick in space makes me go like, oh my God, oh my God. 
what can I do? And they immediately use it as a guitar or they use it as a gun or, you know, it's all those kind of things because that's where us humans feel comfortable, right? We don't feel comfortable to just give the focus onto a stick. And the nice thing about this is you tell them, this is not about you as a performer. What we're doing now is purely about this stick in the space, okay? So it's very, very, very simple. And um, so all these things, you know, there's, there's more classic, um, I realized doing online training that I can do a miniature version of it. There we go, here's my miniature stick. Um, there's lots of classic, you know, things that people do, 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 you know, oh, I can balance it. Oh, that's really brilliant. I can tap it, I can knock it against walls. Now that's not giving focus to the stick. That's about you as a performer. You know, look what I can do about the stick. And taking that step away from yourself and giving the focus to this simple object that frankly, in terms of movement, is quite limited. You know, it really doesn't do much in space. If you, if you look at it purely as a stick. But what it does, it does brilliantly. And that's where the, the strength of the power of it is. So I had this bunch of architects all sort of wielding their sticks around and, and a lot more watching going, what is going on? And then there was a moment where one architect, he just sort of got it. He had the connection, he made this connection with the stick and he just started realizing that actually, if I focus and if I just gently move that stick, it really starts affecting the space. And it was also interesting because he realized it, it's not just the stick I'm moving, but actually there's a whole line that extends in the space. And that's where this little object can be really powerful. And gradually, other people who had sticks, they stopped moving and they just watched that one architect moving his stick. And it all became about that moment. And there was this calm that descended in the room and this magical thing happened where we all just watched that stick because he managed to connect with the object and really brought it alive. And that's, I think, the strength of the LEM. That's the power of the LEM. It's the simplicity. But you have to give yourself over to the process. You have to give yourself over to, you know, to the, to the space, to what's happening. And that's the power of it. Um, yeah. Marvelous. And it, it translates very well into Zoom. <laughs> Well, it's quite fun to watch. Yeah, but when it's funny saying that, you know, when I started online classes, I thought, how the heck am I going to do this? Because I can show you, I'll show you another picture um, of sort of a typical classroom when I, um, when I do a LEM session, when we do it in person. Share screen, there we go. There, I don't know, Oop, and share. Right. There you go. I don't know if you can see that. Is that picture up? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So here you can see this is sort of a typical classroom. You know, it's a right old mess, but what a beautiful mess it is. Um, because the LEM, the beautiful thing is it's not an intellectual approach by any means. You know, it's all about practical experience. And that's why it's quite difficult to talk about it. Um, and, and certainly to write about it as well. I often have students who ask me, well, oh, where can I read more about it? And I have to say like, well, you can't because you sort of have to do it really. Um, you can't write about it uh, because it's not an intellectual approach. It works from gut feeling and it's your response, you know, and in some ways it works like music. You know, music, we all know a piece of music comes on and it just transports you somewhere. And you don't really know why, but music has that power. Um, and the LEM in many ways is, is not dissimilar from that. It's not about intellectual ideas. It's all about experiencing and you're responding. And it's about your awareness of what's going around, like you said, Mark. Yeah. One of the things I find interesting there that you've sort of talked about is um, the idea that you defer the meaning making, that urge to make meaning. Um, because mm. you're quite right to think what what often happens and I think human beings are sort of there's a bit of wiring in us that makes us do this where we like to animate things we like to make the world around us um, come alive in our own way so we use objects and we get very used to using objects and extending ourselves into the space through objects 
but in doing that, we we don't pay attention to them. We use them. Um, and, and I think the, the other thing that it speaks to is, is notions of creativity, that, that part of trying to be creative is not coming up with your own ideas, it's waiting for the ideas to arise, to, to come forward out of the things that you're working with. And it's really important there to push back the urge to make straight away find a meaning and find something um, that is meaningful for you in the thing Absolutely. that you're doing. Very much so. And I mean, these days, you know, and I, I sort of noticed that trend over, over the last decade or so, um, is that we are particularly young, younger people, but not only, um, we're much more adept at making immediate decisions because that's for how we're trained by social media, by interaction with, with, our, you know, with our screens and everything. It's all about yes, no, like, I don't like, and um, tick, non-tick. Uh, and if you look, you know, people uh, say logos, for example, we're trained to, we see a, a, a swoosh, a Nike, Nike swoosh, and immediately we know what it is, you know, and we work on that. Our brains are very adept at making these immediate things. The LEM goes completely against that, like you just said. Mm. And it's, it, it's sort of avoiding those meanings and it's avoiding those kind of framing everything. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, you also, we were talking also about the kinesthetic sense that is in, involved in, in this sort of delegating of meaning to a, an object. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there are two things at play there. One is, one is kinetics, our kinetic sense, where we understand how things move in space. So and that's, a, that's more about direction, speed, weight, time. It's about those kind of more abstract concepts, if you like, so how we understand the nature of movement. Our kinesthetic sense is about the experience of movement, is what it feels like to move. Um, and I, I think a lot of this work is very interestingly poised between the two, where you spend some time exploring how things move whilst listening, at least, to the way in which that evokes things within you. Mm. Yeah, I think yeah. that's absolutely right. Again, but it, you see the LEM does that in a really practical and hands-on way. So if we go further, so we, we had, say, we start with movement, you know, when you're exploring or when you're re reacting to a provocation, right? You start with movement and maybe with a stick or it may be just free movement. Um, now you're, you're building awareness of what that movement does to you. So the limb then becomes very clever and the limb then um, takes the next step. And that could be, for example, and I shall share another picture, uh, that you then transform, transpose that onto a piece of paper. Um, I shall just quickly share the screen. So what you do a lot in the LEM is you do charcoal paintings, you know, and it's really important at that point, if you look at this, at that drawing, you know, you sort of look at it and your first reaction is probably, I have no idea what that is. Right, and that's the perfect reaction because you shouldn't. But the longer you look at it, you start to sort of enter the, you know, the, the, the drawing and you start to sort of make a connection with it and you start to feel the movement because that's where it comes from. You know, that painting would have started with the physical movement of whoever did the drawing. Uh, and the reason that you, you use simple tools like charcoal, um, I'm gonna stop sharing again, is um, because again, it takes away that thing. If I give you a pencil, right? You hold the pencil like that and you're tempted to draw lines or to write things and to make pretty pictures. With charcoal, you can't do that. Charcoal is, is you know, it's, it's a very, you get really messy black hands um, but, and you have to work it physically, you know. With charcoal, you really can put your body into it and you can smudge it and you can sort of work it. And that's the beauty of it. It's a bit like, you know, having a lump of clay and really putting force into it and creating something. Um, so you do that. And by doing that, you, uh, you sort of take another step towards something much more fundamental and much deeper. But you have to give yourself the time to do it. And the limb allows you to take that time and get away from that sort of superficial level of sort of giving meaning to things and understanding it 
It's mm. a physical response, even on a piece of paper. And that's where its strength is. And I always thought that was that was such a central part of Lecoq's teaching as well, was that it wasn't just about learning to move, it was about learning to observe and look and um, understand, well not understand, but appreciate what it was that you were actually seeing. Mm, yeah. Much of, it's much a, it's... Yeah, much of his criticism, or not, not criticism, much of what he would say in class would actually be about working with the class around what are we actually seeing? What, what's yeah. happening in front of us? Absolutely, yeah. And I find that in teaching, you know, when I teach classes, it's really important that you share, that you watch other people work as well. And you watch them make mistakes, you watch, watch them succeed. It's, this is group thing. Although the LEM is, is ultimately quite an individual approach, certainly at the outset, because everybody's response to a given provocation is going to be completely different because it's not an intellectual approach. It's not a wrong or right. You know, you can't, it's either it feels right or, or it, it moves or it doesn't. And um, so it makes that a really individual journey for every, every student, but it's really important to have that group feeling. And again, that was kind of something that I was really worried about teaching online, but um, you can find ways around that. And, and you know, you can share things on, online. So it does actually, Kind of work okay. So it's interesting. We're already getting questions in the chat about how this is brought into relevance uh, to a specific discipline. So to the architects, or I imagine one would also be asking, you know, how how can this how can this be really relevant to a performer? What does a performer get from moving sticks about? I mean, I think you've uh, spoken about it in in wonderful uh, in wonderful terms in terms of kinesthetics and um, and delaying a conclusion and and these are wonderful artistic principles. Specifically, what would a performer be able to do better after having moved sticks around in the space? I think it's a lot to do with, with a being aware of your own physicality, mm -hmm. which if you do the cock training, you to a degree you are anyway. But what the lem brings into it is that it's your physicality in relationship to the space uh -huh. and that you're in habit. And it's also um, your physicality in relationship to other people's physicality. I mean, again, you know, if you look at the sticks, what they teach you, if I move one stick in space, that is interesting. That's, that's you know, and you sort of learn that. The moment you bring a second stick into it, the whole thing changes. And it doesn't become about the one stick anymore. It becomes about the relationship of the two sticks together. And what you start looking at now is less the two stick, the, less the individual sticks, but you look at the space in between and you can sort of start, you know, you start stretching the space, you can twist the space. It's all sorts of things. So it allows you to look at yourself and to feel um, on a different level. And it's not just about you and what, costume you're wearing and what makeup you have, but it's how you behave in relationship to others on stage. And it gives you that sort of bigger picture that's quite a fundamental um, discipline, I guess. In yeah, I would say, especially for actor creators. So you're already sort of thinking as a director, if you're, if you're mm. feeling your way into the spatial relationship between yourself and other mm. performers, then you're already beginning to sort of the mise-en-scene, you're, you're already starting to really put things into the space as you're describing. Yeah. Um, then you yeah. said about just quickly about architects, you know, um, how does that help architects? The way it helps them is not really teaching them something new. A lot of the LEM is not, no, you don't teach people new things. You teach them the awareness to refine something that is actually inherently in us anyway. And architects particularly, they're really bogged down, you know, they all work on computers with their design programs and draw lines and things. And just giving them the freedom to step back and to actually play with the space and take a breath, you know, get away from the sort of two dimensionality that is what the re response from most architects is, is great because it takes you back into actually appreciate what we're doing. We're working in a three-dimensional space that humans will go into and they will interact with. And you, you can forget that when you sort of work on a, on a two-dimensional yeah. space. And, and I think it's important to identify this isn't just interdisciplinary in the sense that it's about, say, you know, a set design that, that integrates the, the work of the actor and the work of the designer. It's it's 
it's not that it's not about set design it's about it's about understanding space in the way that might inform set design but ultimately mm. the actor for the set designer for the director it's about creating spaces that sort of anticipate the drama that is to come within the, the work that you're making yeah well, was it what was interesting um, when we we left Paris uh, and three or four of us started Bouche de la at the outset and all four of us did the second year of the LEM, which only eight people ever did with Lecoq, so we were quite blessed in many ways. Um, but what we and what we wanted to do, we started the company very clearly uh, in order to continue the research um, with the LEM and create work based on that. And what we found is that we found that we, we, we kept asking ourselves, well, um, uh, are we actually using the LEM? This doesn't look, it doesn't look like LEM what we're creating. It looks like Lecoq Theatre, but it doesn't look like LEM. And what we realized more and more is that the LEM itself, the LEM can never be the end. The LEM, LEM is not a separate thing. The LEM has to always be connected to something else. In our case, it was creating theatre. Um, but what the LEM did really well, it was always at the back of our minds, it was always hovering there. And at the right time when we created things, it would just come in and give us a solution because we had the awareness um, you know, of, of, of what it gave us. And it's always, so it just sort of sits there in the background, but it's always there. Uh huh. Um, uh... I'm just wondering. This may be this may be too much to ask, uh, but Aurelian, if people have pens or pencils, I mean, we got, we got a little request in this in the chat. I mean, if people had pens and pencils, can they do something right now with their pens? And I mean, if they took two pens or or something, I mean, is there anything you would guide people to do um, if if they had two linear but, but, objects I mean, in their close vicinity? But literally, just just. Play, play around, have, have a couple of, it doesn't matter if it's pens or pencils or anything. Start off with just one pence, one, one, one sort of stick. And just kind of observe the movement. I call it stick, don't call it pen. And just sort of see what it, what it does. And see if you can discover how that line sort of extends all the way out. And what's really, what becomes really important is, is sort of how you hold the object as well. Because if I hold, you know, if I hold the stick like that, that becomes something else. That's me on a motorbike again, yeah? Um, so give it, give it the care that it deserves and just see what it does. How do the lines move? How do the lines extend in your, in your room where, where you are now? And when you got a bit of a feel for it, it's a very delicate thing and it's quite a limited, you know, it's quite a limited movement. You see, Roger is very, very beautiful there and Lucy, excellent. Um, it's really nice. So then take two bits and see what happens when you bring those two together. You know, try not to look at the screen, what you look like on the screen. Just really give, give those two the focus. Because then you find as well that certain things, the magic that you create can easily be broken. But for example, when two ends touch. So if I put these two ends together, boom, it's gone and it becomes something else. Now it's a recognizable shape, it's the letter V or whatever it is, but it completely um, destroys the dynamic. And the moment you sort of open it up again, so you play around, and it's quite a meditative, it's a, it's a lovely little thing to do. You can sort of stretch the space. You can compress the space. You can also have a go at seeing how far can you stretch the space before the connection between the sticks goes and they become just two, now they're two individual sticks. And when you bring them closer together at some point, boom, they connect again. And um, and if you, you know, if you have, uh, if you have little broomsticks and, and stuff or, or proper, proper sticks, you can do it in a, in a rehearsal space and just play around with it. And I guarantee you, you, you feel, it's all about, you feel when it's right. You feel when it's wrong and equally you feel when it's right. And that's the beauty about the lemon is what Mark said. 
don't force it just wait for it to happen because it will uh, so we we should at this point uh, open uh, open up our conversation to the provocations of the Zoom room here, um, and we have a question from Giovanni, which is uh, in the transfer online of the LEM process, could you name an element that made it through and found its an exist its existence in an online setting, and another element which could not survive this transition? Right, let's just read that quickly. Uh, So an, an element that yeah. made it through yeah. that you okay. felt communicated well yeah. in the online context and then yeah. an element which really didn't make it. <laughs> but let me start the one that doesn't work. I, I, you know, when you work with the sticks, obviously it's great to have performers in a room and they can watch each other explore the room and then they come together and see what happens with those sticks. And although you can do it in, you know, on your own, it's never the same as when you do it with a group of performers and you can then have three sticks, four sticks together and the, the, the spaces you start creating are something else. They're really quite amazing. That is something that for obvious reasons online is a really tricky, really tricky thing to do. And mm -hmm. um, something, for example, that I use, and I can give you a little example if you want. Uh, uh, and that's again something that you can do. You can do at home. I've got a little visual aid here. Can you all see that piece of paper? Yes. Is start with a blank piece of A3 paper or so, and then take a black, smaller black piece of paper and just cut out a few random shapes. Right now, when I say random shapes, it's kind of shapes like this I'm talking about. All right. I'll stick them on here, all right? So you have a few random, about five shapes or so. Um, again, it's what's really interesting, humans, uh, human nature immediately goes to shapes like that. So people become really creative and have an idea and do funky, you know, funky shapes. The problem with something like that, obviously, is that immediately we sort of um, look at, uh, you know, we want to give it me meaning. So this could be a goat's head, or you know, we want to see something in the shape. So use really simple shapes that have no meaning, sort of thing. Um, and then just start playing around with it on a piece of paper. Um, stick them on. And you probably start off with sort of distributing them really nicely. And it's a beautiful balanced sort of piece of paper. But because it's really beautifully balanced, it's also, not very dynamic, it's quite dead. And the more you then play with it, you sort of start creating some sort of dynamics. And I'm just making it up as I go here. Let's have that one as well down there. And the little one we put right up here and see what that does. So immediately, just like that, there's a, there, there, there's a dynamic in there. There's something about the little one up here there's something about the space. And also the other thing, again, it's like the sticks. When you have two sticks together, you start looking at the space in between. It's a similar thing here. If you have shapes like that one, you're much more likely to look at the shape and it's, it's you know, it's form and it's, it's decorative um, uh, meaning. If you have shapes like that, you're much less likely to look at the shape and you start looking at the whole thing and you start looking at the empty spaces in between rather than the shapes and how just changing one shape can completely change the dynamic of everything. And that's a really simple thing to, to, to sort of use. And that's obviously something that transforms really well on um, quite well online and that I use with my students um, because it's really quick and everybody can do it um, and you get sort of immediate results. And it's something that you can do, you know, anytime you want, just play around a bit with it. The more you do it, again, the more you sort of enter and enter the space and you start sort of exploring and it's, it's yeah. So that's something, Giovanni, that I would say is, is, is great. That mm. definitely translates online. Um, but even making, you know, Making things, drawings, I mean, 
charcoal again charcoal drawings you know that's that's a, a, a drawing that student made all these things actually a lot surprisingly a lot of the things we do in a in a normal course translate quite well online even constructing and um, cardboard bits you know constructing little little um cardboard constructions based on on probably a drawing so that would have gone through the process the person who made that would have gone through the process of moving drawing and then probably ended up with with something like that so you end up with, with things and that is all entirely possible online um, to do. It's technically, you, you need to set the space up a bit so that uh, we can see your working area. That's the only slight um, hiccup we, we, mm. we kind of had, but we got, we got the hang of that. Aurelian, um, uh, the question from Elizabeth is, uh, how would you uh, take what you just did with the objects? I mean, this, the shapes on paper or, or mm -hmm. sticks in space. Uh, how, would you take that directly into looking at dramaturgy? Well, I mean, is that something? Way. I mean, so yeah. what, what, you know, how would you sort of make that transition the awareness from something which is very much, you know, seems like very much in the visual arts to working with bodies on a, on a stage? Yeah, no, I mean, that's, um, yeah, you could see, you know, the, the, the black shapes, you could mm. say, okay, well, that's my, my, my stage, and how mm. do I place my performers? And just by simply doing that, you know, that immediately is, is a very direct sort of application. And mm -hmm. um, other things, I can show you a, a couple of, uh, I'll show you an, an interesting example. Um, that again is sort of uh, something that we did, that was at Lisp actually. Um, let me just share the screen. So a next step then from say a cardboard construction would be that you do something like that. Um, so at the moment that doesn't look like much. Uh, can you all, you can see that, yeah? So there's a lot of paper and obviously there's a performer in there somewhere. Oh, um, that's Camille. That's Camille. <laughs> yes, I think it is, yes. Yeah, there she is, look. So then that becomes a whole costume on stage. Um, uh, and another one, you'll recognize him as well. Mm. So there's another costume that would have come out of, of this process. You know, so that's a much more um, direct application again. And then what, when it becomes interesting, again, is when you put the two together. Right. And again, so here you can look at, you, of course, you can look at the individual performers. Um, but actually, what's much more interesting is, again, the space between what happens between the, the, the two of them, what happens between the costumes. So it's that dynamic and you start working with that space. Um, so that's kind of, you know, another um, potentially uh, 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 quite practical application for it. Um, uh, just, just on a simple level, yeah. you, could, you could use those distributions of shapes within space and replace them with people in space and mm -hmm. see how yeah. those dynamics changed. Or with the sticks, with the lines that you've got um, coming together or diverging or moving through space, if those lines are represented by groups of people, you start to um, explore the sort of interaction yeah. between that spatial dramaturgy and the, the human dramaturgy. Mm. And it's interesting, I just want to, put, to throw in one other thing um, that sort of shows how far reaching the limb can be. Um, because obviously I've, you know, I've been teaching for a long time. And so I, I sort of, I, in many ways, I live and breathe limb. Um, and so I notice, I do things like I, I, I drive on a motorway and uh, I obviously focus on my driving, but the way I focus on it is, is I really sort of look at cars in front of me and how they move. You know, it's almost balletic sometimes. Um, and you also realize what uh, which drivers don't have that sort of spatial awareness. It's often the ones that sit in the middle lane, but you clearly sort of look at, you know, you look at other people and you see like they really have not got a spatial awareness of what's going on around them. You know, they're not open, that there's not, there's no openness. There's another really interesting example, and then I'll be quiet, um, which about four or five years ago, the English um, 
uh, national rugby team, they sort of the coaches realized that their players really lost their spatial awareness on, on the pitch, which for a team sport like rugby is incredibly important. You have to know where everybody else is. And they found that um, that was directly linked to screens, you know, the, because the players before the games, they would sort of be on their, on their Twitter and, you know, da -da 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 -dum, and then go on to the pitch and they were still in that narrow frame. So they, um, they said, uh, we're not going to allow you to be on any screens for six hours before each game. So screens are banned. And they brought in a movement specialist to work with them to sort of, you know, re refine that sort of spatial awareness. And again, that's a completely, you know, that's, that's LEM in many ways in a completely different field in sports. But that's a direct, you know, that's again a direct um, uh, uh, relation, a direct connection. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, look, um, we have uh, we have about fifteen minutes left. Uh, well, we have we have about half an hour, but fifteen for for uh, the majority of the conversation. Um, would anybody like to just unmute themselves and ask a question? We have a question here. What happens to our kids uh, who are developing? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Jehan, you're remarking, yeah, what's happening to the spatial awareness. Yeah, that was a frightening one. I, I, yeah. do, have a, I do have a question. I thought it was really profound, the idea of, of taking the stick for what it is and then just exploring that and exactly what you described and then further, like what it evokes and uh, the evocations that come of it. Um, I think that one of the things that we are really asking ourselves right now is that we are really teaching this digital course of ours in a state of absolute conflict where um, we want to celebrate the collective experience. We're talking about, we don't, we're not using the word ensemble. We're talking about the collected, the collective uh, learning experience that everyone is having. So the learning collective is, I mean, we haven't even found the word, but there is a lot of stuff that they're doing, which is shared experience. They're getting up to, together, they're doing all of this work together, et cetera. But they are still in their own individual isolated spaces. And I was just wondering, what has your experience been about that tension between the collective shared experience, the individual isolation uh, at, at one level? And does the evocation, because I'm, I feel like maybe the thing that it evokes, out, like the experience that the, the, four, the 40 different evocations that happen uh maybe something where 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 some other kind of togetherness can can happen and that was one uh so i don't know how that tension works and if you have any observations of that mark or aurelian the, the the second one is currently our pedagogy is entirely focused on what we can teach you in your individual learning capacity in your space for the most part but we're we're, we're venturing into this space of the act of uh creative collaboration not brainstorming creative collaboration, but can we have that moment where you had four people in the room with sticks and seeing what happens between those sticks? How can creativity uh, transcend, how can an embodied creativity transcend the mediated space? And I mean, we're, we're calling it a lab because we don't think it can and we just want to explore it. But what are your thoughts in both those spaces? I think there are technologies that are moving us close to that, but they're not widely enough available. So, so there, are, there are potentially ways in which through augmented reality, for instance, in which we could start to do some of these things. But at the moment, a lot of that technology is not developed and not available in the ways that would make that happen. It would need to be far more pervasive, cheaper, and a lot easier to use than it currently is. So in a, in a way, it's a shame, you know, we were on a journey that could have got us to a place where some of this stuff could have happened in a really uh, interactive, digitally interactive way. Um, but I'm, it's, it's heartrending that we're, we're not actually there yet. If there's one good thing that might come out of this, it might be that there is a lot more effort put into um, developing those technologies and making them more widely and easily accessible. Um, mm. I think you're absolutely right. Um, it's really interesting that development because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a technophobe. I like cardboard and charcoal and wooden sticks. Um, so I was really skeptical all the time, but I've had really interesting, um, interesting conversations with someone who works in that field. Um, 
And we just got on like a house on fire because he was really interested in what I'm doing in the LEM. I was really interested in what he was doing with virtual, but particularly with augmented reality. I think that's, and I don't know if you know the difference, virtual reality is when you sort of been close in a, in a space, in a three-dimensional virtual space. Augmented reality is when it starts, when it mixes um, the reality that, that you're in with something that it overlays. So there's an interaction between the, the, the space that we inhabit and, and some sort of digital um, thing. And one thing that was really interesting that he said is because they are actually working a lot on content now um, for those for those technologies. The technologies are, are you know, they're relatively advanced. Um, so they work a lot on, techno uh, on, on content creation. And what they started doing at the outset is they worked with film directors. They brought in film directors and said, oh, perfect. They're going to, you know, they're going to help us create Film directors were completely flabbergasted because they could not handle the three-dimensional concept. Because film directors, obviously, they're completely used to having their screen. You know, that's what they're working to. And that's fair enough. And they do, you know, a lot of them do a fabulous job. Um, so they started working with theatre people. And finally, that, you know, that seemed to work because the theatre um, practitioner has got that awareness and that understanding of a three-dimensional space. And so I'm quite, as like you, Mark, I'm actually, I changed my opinion quite a bit and I'm quite hopeful because um, the screen technology, you know, mobile phones, they will go and they will be replaced by something else, which is in a, in a much more augmented reality world. And I'm hoping for our children, you know, it's like what happens to our kids. Um, hopefully that this technology will sort of enable us again to sort of open up and because it's an augmented reality and mixes the two, will um, enable us to actually um, connect with the world we live in, which yeah. screens clearly don't do. I think something um, that, you know, intelligent glass will be the, one of the next things where you won't have a, a screen that is, that, that, that is just, you can't see through. You will have a screen yeah. that you can see through. So you, it'll be superimposing what you're working on in front of yeah. um, the world that you're, looking at or working with beyond that. Yeah, that there were interesting, interesting developments, uh, you know, with uh, augmented reality art. There, there was some artists, I think, in New York. They sort of hijacked museums and developed a program, um, a little app on the, on the phone, so you could hold it up to a, a painting in the museum and it would overlay art that they created and interact with the painting, so it became something completely different. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of interesting potential there, um, because to be honest, frankly, technology, we can't, we can't stop it, we can't turn it off, it, it's here and it's going to develop. So finding ways that are saying, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah it'd be not. nice to be aware of the fact that, uh, like now, we're all sat, we're all looking at a device, and in, in, in LEM terms, we're, we're static and we're not we're, we're not interacting, we're not doing anything mm. in relation to the object that we're working with. Wouldn't it be nice if we could actually have, you know, if the screen of the laptop became something that we were moving with as yeah. well, that was part of our interaction with the space rather than just yeah. the medium for our interaction or just something that communicated our interaction, that it became part of that work rather than just, yeah. you know, the thing that we sit in front of in a rather docile way. And I think that's kind of what I, you know, where, where I was heading with the, the, the thing that um, you need to set yourself up. If, if I run a, a LEM workshop online, and that is Jehan's question as well, um, I think, uh, you know, it, it's, it needs to have a slightly different format so that we can see the things that people create. We can see them stick bits of cardboard onto it. And I can, as a guide, because the LEM, sort of needs a lot of guidance, I think. And sometimes you let students run into making mistakes because they learn from it. Sometimes you stop them and say like, well, there's a, you know, there's something that doesn't quite work there. So I kind of, in the process, I kind of need to see how they're creating these things, not just the end product. Um, so so th there's that aspect of it. Um, but also what, what's interesting is um, because, my partner, who's in the room, funny enough, 
um, yesterday had lots of Zoom business meetings and she came home and said like, oh, I've had it with Zoom, you know, I've been on a screen all day long and it's like it's doing my head in. Um, and after, it's true, after a while of Zooming, you sort of go like, I don't want to look at, you know, rectangle anymore. But the, but when I teach Lem, the nice thing is that you have moments on the screen and then you have moments where you go off and you you, you have a whole glue gun and you stick bits of cardboard together or you do charcoal drawings while the Zoom meeting is still going on. So everybody's, so it's sort of, First little baby steps of, of, of transcending something, I feel, which because I was really worried about, you know, is that aspect going to work online? And so far, fingers crossed, it kind of, it kind of works. And um, you have to slightly adapt it, but yeah. So yeah, um, there you go. Yeah. I hope that answers your Anybody question. else like to unmute themselves? There's not, there's, um, there don't see many questions in the chat, but anybody like to just, yeah, Elizabeth. Yeah, hi. Um... I worked with uh, François Le Cog in 1998 in Bogota, and um, we did um, a work, a beautiful work that changed my way that I see people on the street. Um, we had to go to the street and observe people, um, people with a drama, and, uh, that were showing that something was happening to them. And then to go into the space and try to create that character using the, you know, these qualities, oil, water, uh, air, all the elements. And then we reached to a beautiful performance um, that didn't have much words, but it was very much um, built on um, the relationship between these characters that we created based on our observations. Um, and then um, I just thought that what our country needed to do, um, you know, Colombia, was just to observe each other. So, it, it, you know, as a person, it changed me how we observe the world and how we observe other people. Um, so in that capacity of observation and using the space, um, um, you know, I, I'm just aware that every second that we are with our students is very, very important. We won't have that time with them anymore. We won't have any more time to mend this moment. So it, it, this thing that you said that LEM requires lots of guiding, lots of, you know, yes, guidance. So how you guide them, to create that space here. If you have achieved that, you know that I, I'm going to create this space, a crea I call it a creative space. How do you going to create that creative space um, mm. beyond this screen? Yeah, I, I think Elizabeth, you're, you're a question uh, and uh, lament in a way is, is uh, is spoken to also by Giovanni. Do you, Giovanni, do you want to just unmute yourself and say what you want to say? It's very similar to what Elizabeth is saying. Um, yeah, I think this is a, we have to think about the technology as a, as it, technology has no ethics at its core. So technology doesn't ask the question whether it is a good idea to be used or not. I think we need to do that, to have that question because whether we want to use this technology and replace our real life interaction with something that is technologically enhanced. I think that's a very crucial question. And it's an ethical question. It's not any more a technological question. I think you're right. It's, it's, it's a huge dilemma. Um, and in some ways, I guess, you know, uh, the problem is that I, I think the problem, uh, one of the problems is that as I said, technology, I don't think it's, it's not going to go away. You know, we're not going to revert to, to ditching digital technology. It's going to progress if we want it or not, I think. So uh, maybe a way of thinking is, OK, so how can we influence the development of it? And how can we make it into at least something that sort of is close to, you know, it helps us. To, to regain a, a sort of a balance because at the moment it's really quite out of balance. Jahan. I just, uh, just 
Oh, Elaine, I'm just going to come back to the point, the story that you told about the filmmakers not being able to cope, but the theater makers being able to cope, right? I mean, I just want to loop that back to what Gio is saying also, but but like, yes, we have there's this inevitability of moving on and embracing and working with, but the thing that gets lost in the process, at some point, will we not ever know what, like, yes, we can say we'll stay in the blended learning format, but then the slippery slope that Gio envisages is is real. It's it's there, right? And we, we have to A, acknowledge it. We have to B, acknowledge that we're on it. What happens when we run out of people that, the augmented reality people can't come to to figure out something because they never had the rugby team that never knew the world without a screen. The what happens when we we completely divorce ourselves from from and if I'm not talking about this in terms of trying to be a purist, I'm not a purist, but I know that everything I'm capable of doing right now in this uncertain time has come from what I learned in pure theater, bunch of people in a room playing with sticks. You know? I don't think I don't think that sort of dystopian world where we're all just plugged in. Is I think what's been really interesting, certainly working within higher education uh, in the UK, what's been really interesting is that the initial reaction to the pandemic was a massive swing towards online learning, only to find that actually students don't like it, uh, staff don't like it. Uh, it's revealed all of the limitations, all of the um, you know the, the problems all of the inherent sort of lack of humanity. It's revealed many of the ethical issues as well. Uh, and what, what, what has happened since then is a kind of rowing back from that. So certainly the university I work at has now committed that there will be face-to-face -face teaching as long as you know, the government allows us to provide it, there will be face-to-face -face teaching um, for students. Um, and only the stuff that you know, the stuff that has to, or that, that, that can and uh, is better done online will remain being done online. And there will always be things that are convenient to do online and, and, and where the, the difference isn't, isn't you know, sig significant enough to mean that you stop doing it online. But equally, there are things that have to be done face to face. And th that's so true for theatre, for dance, for the performing arts. But of course, it's also true for nursing and for engineering. So, you know, who wants a doctor who's never actually put their hands on a patient and said, does this hurt here? You know, you don't want that person as your doctor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so Barat would like to say something. Thank you, Amy. Um, I, I have a bunch of uh, responses and some of them in my head, I think seem to be a, a feeling of speaking out loud. So I, I, I'm not entirely sure if I'll have a clear question at the end of it, but because we were just talking about technology and uh, how it's progressing. Um, and uh, while this pandemic has accelerated the push towards people using technology and revealing uh, all the issues that we're dealing with, I'm sure there'll be a sect of people that's going to look at these and say, uh, how can we resolve them and overcome them? Uh, from the perspective of what theatre has played in terms of uh, its role in shaping us, um, I also feel that uh, ethically, um, how theatre stays up with how the world is evolving uh, to be able to show a relevant mirror, uh, whatever the time may be and whatever the technology being applied may be, I think somewhere... Um, not discounting physical intimacy and being in the same space. Uh, I feel that it is also the responsibility of people involved in theater to continue to adopt and see how they can create those spaces uh, intimate, uh, how they can make um, real collective consciousness uh, in those spaces. And so it's like a, it's like an endeavor that continues as society continues to evolve theater can, or the definition of theater or the experience of theater I feel continues to evolve with it as well. And as long as there are people willing to explore it, uh, I think that would continue to create headway. Um, that's a comment on that. Uh, I do want to say in the exploration of the LEM while I was moving the pens, um, one of the things is, is the instinctive need to make meaning of what the pen is or how what, what it's doing to the space itself. 
But I do wonder, by the end of that experience, the, the connection that we're creating or the insight that we're getting for ourselves, again, sort of relies on our ability to make meaning. So I'm wondering where the process um, comes to an end and how do you transition? Because ultimately, this is how I feel, somewhere that convergence of towards the end of that experience, then wanting to make meaning again of it comes back into play is, is a thought that I was getting. So I'm not entirely, well, I, I guess a clear question could be how do you, yes. I, th I think the danger, if you, if you, if you're searching for meaning too quickly, if you're looking for meaning too quickly, you will come up only with the meanings that you already know. You won't come up with the meanings you don't know. By deferring the search for meaning, you're more likely to move away from that comfort zone and to find new things that you didn't know. Yeah. I thought I also think, um, well, uh, who, I can't remember who it was oh. now uh, in Colombia, Elizabeth, who talked mm -hmm. about the, um, you know, putting on that show, uh, observing people in the street and then putting on a movement piece. Now, people who go and unless they read the blurb and unless you describe to them, well, that was the process. We went out into the street. If you don't do that, they go and watch your piece. They may not necessarily read into it. Um, uh, oh, that's based on people in the street who have some drama going on. They get something from it, but it may be something completely different than what the starting point was. And I think that is kind of, in, you know, that, that's an interesting, um, and that's a lot what the Cox Theatre is about anyway. Um, it's not about explaining, but it's giving an audience an experience and they bring in their own, um, uh, their own experience, their own response, they respond in their own way. Mm -hmm. I think Lucy would like to yeah, yeah Lucy's got something to say I'm loving listening to everybody um, I was just really connecting some dots so you know the point the, the process that Elizabeth described of going out and watching people interact and relating their movements and their interactions in a kind of through the element so through a material process is is again, not necessarily, it's looking through different eyes. It's not looking for meaning or why is he, you know, shouting at her, he must be angry. Blah, blah, blah. It's feeling it and really connecting with the hum humanness of the movements and the interactions. And there's a humanity as well that's evoked by the creation of these different spaces between the, you know, just between the sticks is kind of, it's alive and living. And as humans, we are desperate to impose meaning. But you know, one thing we always got slapped on the on the head for at Lecoq was being sort of what Lecoq would say monolithic, you know, where you come with a very fixed idea and it's a monolith. And when we impose, you know, meaning, you know, ahead of actually enter engaging with what's happening, you know, we're just imposing something we're just putting a sticker on it that means nothing and i think it's really fundamental and connected to you know what what the discussion around you know are we stuck with technology what you know uh, how are we interacting reality and unreality i think for young people kids who've grown up with technology they don't have the same differentiation that I have between reality and unreality because they're very enmeshed for these kids. They've grown up with it. And so there's a merging of what's real and what's unreal. And also I think the technology that we have available to us now, as various people have already mentioned, this is not gonna be it for very long. This is what we have now, but it's going to progress. And in the next five years, it probably will look completely different. And I think it's really important to explore what is, where do we find the humanity? And the, you know, and by that, I also mean a sort of dynamism, you know, something dynamic, which is universal and core and felt rather than necessarily understood. How do we find that relationship with technology? And this, these sorts of explorations that people are talking about are really crucial. And I'm delighted to hear you all 
and they hear about what different people are doing and the problems that you're hitting and the things that are working and what your frustrations are as well. You know, like Mark described, the students don't like not being face to face. And because we need that, you know, we, we can't read each other's body language particularly well when you've just got the head. And so then it's difficult to feel, which is what Elizabeth was describing and feeling is actually, you know, what it's all about. That's the drama, isn't it? Not the ideas, it's the feelings. And I think the LEM is very powerful in evoking feelings from its audience. Mm. Um, that, I don't know how you do that remotely, mm. but yeah, I'll leave it there. But Thanks, Lucy. Thanks. Um, we have time for just a two minute something from Charlotte, if you have just two minutes, Max. Would you like to unmute Charlotte? Hi. Yes, hello. Um, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Um, I remember when I was at Lecoq, the teachers just screaming, Lispas Kivi, Lispas Kivi, or something. Uh, and now I kind of really understand this, what you're saying about this empty space in between or space in between that kind of lives and how to kind of, I don't know, in, infuse it with something. But I have a kind of practical question just regarding the charcoal drawings. Um, what you were saying about you know, do, drawing the shapes or the movement, is that how How would I apply, how do I apply that? Because I like, I've been quite in my head recently because I've been trying to write and do a lot of work for like TV and I'm getting very stuck in my head. And this whole conversation is very, uh, has definitely enabled me to feel like I can just unleash and go and move in my body now and have some ideas kind of come this way through integrating into my body, but how can I use the charcoal drawings? Like, how is that gonna inspire me to like create something? I, I don't know. I would like to know how, because I want to do it. And I feel like I could, I could get down with doing something on paper and then trying to get up and, you know, create something with it. But how, how do you use that? I don't understand. Um, by the way, Charlotte, we're gonna hang around after the meeting. Uh, a sort of okay. foyer experience, because if you want a long answer from Aurelian, and you might want to hang around for, for that. Aurelian, do you just have like a one minute reply? And, I mean, great that you start with movement, definitely the place to be, because that's got such a, you know, an, an instinctive response, and that's the way to go at that point. When you then um, do drawing, charcoal drawings, just let yourself go, do loads of them. You know, don't buy expensive paper, buy cheap paper, so you can get, get some sheet after sheet until you're all black all over. Um, <laughs> and then step back and maybe invite somebody else to come and just respond to those. You know, they can talk about it or they can move or, or whatever, but invite somebody else and, you know, hold up a drawing like that and go like, so there you go. What does that make you feel? Does that make you want to move if it doesn't want to make you move? Uh, another thing which is interesting with charcoal drawings, so you look at it that way around, if you turn it, it becomes something completely different. If you turn it again, so give it a chance, step away from it, look at it from a distance, give it time. Always give it time, because the more you enter it, it'll start moving, you start finding the textures in it, you, you know, you start inhabiting it, you start discovering new things. Wow, okay, yeah, cool. Brilliant, uh, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. There you go. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you so much, Mark and Aurelian, for joining us this evening. Thank you so much to DSM for hosting us uh, brilliantly as usual. Um, I want to invite you all to return next week, same time, same Zoom room, uh, to dis continue to discuss interdisciplinarity um, and the way in which it can be a source of resilience to us theater artists in these times. Um, next week, Meg Keating, who is head of the Tasmanian University of Tasmania School for the Arts, is gonna be here uh, talking about how, when they were about to destroy completely, uh, d uh, completely shut their theater department, instead what they did was they took it and they put it at the heart of a completely interdisciplinary arts degree. And a theater and collaboration became essentially the core of uh, inter-arts um, BA program. So it's a very, very exciting transformation that they, uh, that they made at, at, at UTAS. Um, and really theater was just about to disappear completely from the scene. So it was sort of a miraculous uh, save, save salvation from extinction. So please return, uh, we'd, we'd love to see you. 
And uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you again, Mark and Aurelian. Thank you, Amy, for moderating and curating this amazing conversation. Thank you a so pleasure. much. A yeah. pleasure. Um, we're, we're very keen to hear from you, especially those of you who have been coming regularly. Um, I'm going to just put my email ID in. You can write to me personally, jehan at thedramaschoolmumbai.co.in. Shruti, if you could please type that in. Um, I just need two questions is what have you been what how have these talks been useful to you and in in what ways um, so there's the email ID um, and the second one is you know uh, what what do you want to come back and learn more about theater pedagogy for uh, unrehearsed future um, these things will just really help us keep the conversations going because we just think it has purpose into the long-term future and also if you feel like you have something to share um, you know, we're, we're, we're absolutely open to putting you in one of the chairs in the long run. Yeah. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Aurelian, for all this time. Um, and keep the conversation alive. If you guys want to keep it, this room is open right now. So please get off mic and have chats. But I am putting this Telegram link back in.